Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. This is the lovely podcast, The Endurance of Labor Laws. I am your lovely host, Leslie Sullivan. And today is episode 21, and we're going to take a look at the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, also known as ILWU. It's a very interesting labor union. Uh my mouth dropped a couple times here with this union. Um it's definitely got some scandal. It's definitely dealing with a lot of money. and um they have definitely affected our economy especially our global economy in terms of shipping and things like that so let's go ahead and get started on this one it was founded in august 11th 1937 their legal status is a 501c5 labor organization they are headquartered in san francisco california their membership as of 2020 is 29056 which is really interesting that i find that it is such a small union compared to other unions and the reason why i'm surprised by this is because we'll we'll see here that um their average pay for some of these workers is $171,000 as of 2019 now you heard me right that's $171,000 and that's basically what a general practitioner gets paid here in Oklahoma and that's what these workers are getting paid that's their average pay which means some make way more some make a little less from what i've seen none of them make less than 85k a year so what i find interesting is that they only have a little over 29,000 members but yet they make bank they make way too much money considering what their labor is i think that's ridiculous that they get paid what a doctor gets paid and yet they've never been to medical school this is very disturbing to me so i can see why they have some scandals and some problems but anyway their international president which that's a red flag right there is willie adams so when you have the word international there it means that they are not only operating in the united states but they're operating elsewhere and especially with this particular union it is operating on a global scale so this would be why this union um to me is already kind of shady because it may have started in the united states but they have other locations in other countries and when you have that happening you're dealing with a lot of money and it's almost like a slush fund and we're going to see that here um it says that their subsidiaries um are international longshore and warehouse pacific longshoremen and a memorial association they are affiliated with the canadian labor congress that's very suspicious to me uh and also international transport workers uh, federation which i've never heard of that we might want to look into that as well this is very interesting it says their revenue as of 2014 or in 2014 was 7 million 380 dollars 493 Their expenses was five million nine hundred eighty and fifty-two dollars, and the number of employees that actually work at this particular union, like they actually maybe are like the administration people for this union, as of two thousand and fourteen was thirty-three employees. So let's go ahead and dive into this one because it's definitely um, kind of shocking to me. It says here the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. is a labor union which primarily represents dock workers on the west coast of the United States which is Hawaii or sorry not Hawaii California over there they also have uh dock workers uh in Hawaii and in British Columbia Canada that's where that international president kind of comes into play because we're dealing with another country in respect to this it says the union was established in 1937 after the 1934 west coast waterfront strike a 3 month three month long strike that culminated in a four day general strike in San Francisco, California and the Bay Area. It disaffiliated with the AFL-CIO on August 30th, 2013. What I would want to know is why they disaffiliate because whenever these unions are disaffiliating and then and then reaffiliating, it's usually to deal with money or some type of power struggle as well or scandal, either way. It usually comes down to those things. It says the union which still uses hiring halls. I don't know what hiring halls are. We'll go back and take a look at that later in time. Has a single labor contract with the Pacific Maritime Association which covers all 29 seaports. Oh, that that's suspicious right there cuz that's a monopoly which covers all 29 seaports on the west coast of the United States from Bellingham, Washington to San Diego. That's that's uh well, wow, definitely a monopoly there. It's 15,000 dock workers are paid an average of $171,000 in 2019. That is way too much money for this. That's ridiculous. 
The union has been described as the aristocrat of the working class. That is very true. I can see why. And their members, lords of the docks. Mm-hmm. I'm not surprised by that. For their high pay and power over a choke point of the global economy. I completely agree. I think this is ridiculous. But guess who allowed this? You and me. The taxpayers of this country, other citizens of the United States, we allowed this to happen. That's, that's what that means there. Um, you know, what's important is that whoever is listening to this, regardless of whether you are a Republican or a Democrat or Libertarian, or maybe you don't really affiliate with one particular party or the other, it's still our duty as citizens of the United States to call people out on this stuff. Because here's what people don't realize is that when you overpay employees like this when you overpay union members it affects your economy meaning it affects the price of goods and then when they go on strike because they're throwing a hissy fit it affects our access to goods now what do i mean by goods anything that you can purchase or sell so this could be lumber it it could be kleenex it could be motor oil basically everything that you purchase basically everything that's in a Walmart everything that's in a Target everything that's at a Costco everything that is a product these people basically have a chokehold on it and they have a chokehold on it because they have put themselves in charge of our seaports now i don't know what you know about seaports but i studied a lot of history in college and i i used to read encyclopedias all the time because that was one of my hobbies before uh, going to college and it still technically is but uh, my summer months in high school I mostly read I just loved to read I'd be out by the pool reading or I'd be inside reading if it was too hot and one thing I learned a lot about countries and nations and just groups in general is that if you want power regardless of what century you were living in whether you're talking about the 15th century or the 21st century If you have control over the seaports, you are the ones who have control over way more than people that live inland, than people that live like within the United States and are landlocked. Because those seaports determine what enters and what leaves your country and what it what enters and leaves your nation. So, I find this very interesting that this labor union has been allowed to get so powerful. And what I find interesting is that they are headquartered in San Francisco, in California, and California is one of the worst run states in the United States. I love you California. I just don't like how your state is run. And when I say your state, I don't mean every single citizen within the state of California. I mean whoever you have elected to be in charge of your state. And here's why I don't like what's going on there. First of all, California thinks it's better than pretty much everybody else. You're not. We're all equals. But also California, it is so expensive to live there. And I know this for a fact because I can look at the stats and number 2, I meet people all the time that moved to Oklahoma from California because they cannot afford to live out in California. They basically they can either stay in California and lose everything or they can move to Oklahoma and live a very luxurious life compared to California. Like a two bedroom or three bedroom house out in California would easily cost 2 million. Easily. You know, that same house in Oklahoma would maybe cost 150k, 200k depending on where you live, whether you live in the city or Edmond, which Edmond is uh, or Nichols Hills is a very uh kind of hoity toity and I don't mean that in a bad way it's just more of a more expensive place to live the houses are nicer because they're not as old they're newer and they're better built in terms of that um but you know it's one of those things that if it's not affordable to live somewhere in the state particularly California then you need to look at why is it not affordable well this is a big reason why these high wages excessively high overinflated wages of these workers And also it goes into what are the property taxes in the state of California. See the state of California is seen as a democrat state, meaning a blue state. Nothing against democrats, nothing against the color blue. But typically when you have a state these days that is run by democrats and it's known as a blue state, here are the typical things you're going to have. Inequality in wages, overinflated wages for unions, extremely high property tax, extremely high sales tax, it's not affordable and you probably will have more violence there, more gang violence. 
Examples of this would be in, in hot pockets um, that are located within L.A. L.A. is not known for being very safe at all. It was way safer back in the day than it is now. Another example, this is in Chicago, Illinois, but Chicago and Detroit as well are known for being crime, crime infested. And, you know, especially with Chicago, it's known for being very Democrat. So what's interesting is that these, these people that claim to be um, pro, how do I word this? They, they claim to be pro-civil rights, but yet they want to take your gun rights away. And not only that, they want to raise your taxes. And for those that are okay with raising taxes, you need to be careful what you wish for. Because, see, here's the thing. Whenever they're raising taxes, yes, it is the rich that predominantly pay for all that. But the higher your taxes go, the smaller the middle class gets. So when you punish the rich with overtaxation, which that's what that is, when you overtax somebody, basically anything over 10% is way too much to be charging someone in taxes. And here's why. The more you tax the rich, the more their money is being taken out of the economy and it's being sent directly to the federal government or to the state government. So a state or federal level, when you take monies out of the economy, it's no longer technically part of your currency. So if it's no longer part of your currency, it basically becomes dead money. That's what happens when the federal government and the state government overtax people. They take monies away from people and they just spend it on these social welfare programs that don't create jobs. They do not create revenue. And here's the thing. If you have wealthy people that only get taxed like 10%, which I wish that across the board, that no one, whether lower class, middle class, upper class, whatever, I pray that no one pays more than 10%. And here's why. Because you will have more money more of your currency flowing throughout your market. And what that means is, is that more people will have more access to money. Because see, here's the thing. It is the rich that provide most of the jobs. Why? Because they have money and they can start businesses. They can hire more people. They can give people raises. But unfortunately, when you have this high taxation, it prevents the wealthy from creating more jobs. An example of this is let's say you're a plumber and you start your own business, let's say in your late 20s, let's say you started your apprenticeship when you're 18 or 19 years old and then by your late 20s you you start your own business, right? God bless you, that's a wonderful thing. Let's say by the time you're in your 30s your business is really growing, really 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 growing. You're not super rich yet, but you're growing. You have more and more employees. Well, let's say you get to be in your 40s. Now you're really starting to make really good money. And then let's say you get to your 50s, you're starting to make millions of dollars. Well, by that time, you have a lot more money. You're able to open up more satellite locations for your plumbing business. You're able to hire more people. You're able to help provide them with excellent insurance without having to go on some social welfare program. And because you're able to pay them more, those people can actually buy houses on their own. They can purchase more vehicles on their own. They can do more. However... Let's say you know, you're this business owner, you're making millions of dollars, you're employing all these people. But let's say, for example, the federal government and your state, let's say you're in the state of California, let's say they raise the taxes. Well, guess what? As the owner of that multi-million dollar business that you have, you will have less money to pay your employees because you're paying more in taxes. So what is a business owner going to do? If they don't have as much money to pay their employees – and to keep their head above water, and they don't have enough extra revenue, you know, extra assets, so to speak, in their bank account to open up more satellite locations for their plumbing business, then guess what? They're not going to be able to employ as many people. They're not going to be able to give raises like they used to. They may have to cut back on health care expenses, meaning offer less health insurance, maybe do away with life insurance, maybe do away with disability insurance. So here's the thing. The more the federal government and the state government removes from your paycheck, whether you're rich, middle class, or lower class, it doesn't matter what tax bracket you're in. When the government taxes you more, you have less. That is what is happening here. So whenever I see that someone is making way too much money there and it's going through a union, I get very suspicious very quick. 
because these workers are making way too much money compared to everybody else. I mean, it's ridiculous making $171,000 a year and you're a dock worker. Nothing against dock workers, but I mean, you haven't been to medical school. You're not an MD, a DO, a PA, you're not a nurse practitioner, and I'm going down the line like of being less educated, you know. Like these people haven't even been to nursing school. I mean, just basic. And yet they are making so much money in in a type of how are worth this in a type of job that you don't have to be educated to do it. See, your your job, your job title and your job responsibilities should match your pay. It should match. If it doesn't match, we've got a problem. whether it's inflation or deflation and here in this particular example it is inflation but let's say for example it was the opposite let's say for example these workers only made 35k a year i would say whoa they need to be making 55k considering that they are doing a blue collar job it's probably very difficult work but they should be making enough to to live cuz 35k is not enough to live off of in most places especially california and the west coast but this overinflated rate This explains to me a lot about the cost of our goods cuz I watch stuff like this. Cuz sometimes people will they'll hyperventilate over the fact of how much something costs and they'll blame the company. Well, this tells you right here, it's not always the manufacturer's fault of the cost of goods. Cuz sometimes these manufacturers if they're trying to get goods into the United States or move goods from one coast to the other within the United States it's not always the particular company of the product that is dictating that price excuse me sometimes it's the people that are moving their freight that are saying hey you're going to pay us this because we're unionized so really take a look at what's behind the dollar amount so let's say for example china is shipping in computers right let's say they're shipping them in and they're coming in through some of these seaports that are on the west coast China may be selling them for one price into our country, but the price of those goods go up drastically when you're dealing with a union because unions think way too highly of themselves, especially with this dollar amount. So what businesses in America will do and the United States will do is they have to up the cost of what they're willing to say those product what they're willing to sell those products for to make up for the cost of the shipment. to make up the cost of these unions of what these unions are charging them to get their products into the United States. So that's what it means when it says that this union has a choke point or a choke hold at these ports and it's affecting the global economy. Meaning anyone that brings products into the United States has to deal with this union. That's why they're too big and they're too powerful and they should be broken up. Cuz that is ridiculous. See cuz here's the thing. You know, I'm single and I live in Oklahoma. You know, I notice when the price of things go up high. I notice it big time, but just imagine how much these prices affect people who have families. Maybe they have like two or four kids or something and they're trying to make ends meet and both parents are working. Well, this would affect the middle class big time because see the middle class in the United States is very unique. See, cuz here's the thing. It's how do I word this? It's easier to get into the middle class tax bracket than it is to get in the upper class tax bracket, and the reason for that is because of pricing, the pricing of goods, and do your wages match what you do? So let's say, for example, you work a job here in Oklahoma and you make thirty-five k, but yet you're buying products that are being shipped and moved about by unions like this, the ILWU, but they're workers who are lower educated workers. They're not as educated. They're making way more than you. I would say at least five or six times, almost six times more than you. But yet they may be less educated than you. but yet the products that you're purchasing in your home state they are being driven up or down in terms of pricing based on what this union is charging companies that are trying to get their freight into the country is what i'm saying so realize where your money is going so when you go to the store and you're buying products realize that 
you're not just paying Walmart or Target. They're not the only ones making money off of what you're paying for. You've got unions like this that are making bank. Cuz look at their revenue from 2014 was a little over 7.3 million dollars. Guess what? That's our money. That's our money. The taxpayer and technically anybody that is working or living in the United States is paying for this whether you are a citizen or not. See, that's the thing. When you go to a store and buy something, you don't have to be a citizen to to buy milk or to buy lumber. But guess what? Even if you're not a citizen of the United States, you're paying for these people to have overinflated wages. So if anything, if I wasn't a citizen of the United States and I am a citizen, I'm still irritated about this, but even If I wasn't a citizen of the United States, this would really irritate me because I know that people that are here illegally sometimes they have a tough time getting access to goods that they need. And this is probably a big hindrance to them. These unions they they, they overinflate the price of goods. And why? Greed. Wall Street is not the only industry or entity that loves money. Unions obviously love money. They make it seem like they're only interested in a safe work environment and having an 8-hour work day. That's not true because if that's all they cared about, they wouldn't go on strike for 3 months at a time or really try and put the squeeze on the employer or have these picket lines or things like that. It's about money. And this tells me this is about greed because anyone that is making the the same amount of money as a doctor and they're doing this kind of work, that's ridiculous. I just I'm just like you've got to be kidding me to make that kind of money. Like these people are not poor is what I'm saying. And what's irritating to me about this is that a lot of these union workers that make this kind of money, they make it seem like they're at the bottom of the barrel. And that they're not making much money, they don't have good benefits, you know, they'll they'll pull out um some little fact and make it seem like they're the underdog when they're not. I'm sorry if you're making A hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars a year, and you're not an MD or a DO. You have nothing to complain about. If anything, you are leasing and fleecing the American people with that kind of pay. Like that is ridiculous. I, I'm just like you've got to be kidding me. See, because here, here's another thing to, to take into account here. You don't have to have a college education to be a dock worker. So get this. Extremely less educated people are making a hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars a year. Like you don't have to have a college degree to be a dock worker, but yet look at the kind of money they're making. That's ridiculous. Because then look at all the people that are going to college. All these students, they have all this student loan debt. But most students, when they get out of college, when they graduate, they are not making anywhere close to a hundred seventy-one thousand dollars. But yet unions like this are crying, "Oh, woe is me! Oh, woe is me!" Really, "Oh, woe is me!" And you make that kind of money, and plus they probably get really cushy healthcare benefits. So just really take into account, look at the big picture. Because, you know, these unions, they try and make it seem like they're the underdog, they're not. They're trying to make it seem like they're all poor, they're not. They're trying to make it seem like they're the victim, they're not. It's the consumer that's the victim here which is you and me because we are the ones who are paying their wages. And the way that you are paying their wages is when you're paying the high cost of goods over a short term and long term period of time. Because regardless of where you shop, the cost of these goods and the cost of doing business with these people is being passed down to you and me because we are the consumers in this country. So just know that whether you are in a union or not, you are still a consumer in the United States. And the consumers need to wake up to this. This is ridiculous. Cuz if there's one thing that irritates me is when I go to the supermarket and I'm I'm trying to buy food, you know, to cook for family, you know, at Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter, and I look at the cost of bread and milk. And then sometimes I'll look at, you know, the people that are shipping and receiving the milk and the bread you know are are they part of a union and if they're part of a union sometimes i'm just like okay is this why the cost of their product is way too high because you know unions you know they do help people get better wages but there's a difference between getting a better wage and a ridiculous wage because when you're in a union and this may irritate people in a union i per, i honestly don't care if it offends you 
Because if anything, the consumer should be offended at the kind of wages you're making. If you're making $171,000 a year, that is insane. But here's how I look at it. You know, if you're working and you're in a union and you're making this kind of money, you really have nothing to complain about. And when you're making that kind of money, you technically are stealing from the consumer. You're basically a thief. And here's why. You're overpricing your goods. You are manipulating the market with your wages and what you are demanding from people, with what you are demanding from these companies. And here's why it's wrong. If it's wrong to manipulate the stock market, it's illegal. You can check with the Federal Trade Commission if you have any questions about that. But if it's if it's illegal and wrong, it's a federal offense. If it's wrong to manipulate the stock market, then it's also wrong to manipulate the global economy, which is exactly what this union is doing and has been doing for a long time. Which very much disappoints me because that is not the American way. This is not capitalism. This is not free market. This is a single union having a chokehold over the seaports and making it so that no one else can do this kind of work. That's not free market. That's like a little dictatorship. And we need to wake up to this. It's just ridiculous. I mean, cuz just think about, it. you know, if they didn't have a chokehold on our ports, our seaports, the cost of our goods would not be as high. Well, I'm not saying they need to make peanuts. I would never wish that on anybody, but I think $171,000 a year per employee that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I'd be okay if they made 55k, which is still kind of high, but you know, I would be okay with that, but they make almost $200,000 a year. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Ridiculous. Like I know when I'm being leased and fleeced and and you should know too. Like this is ridiculous. Like I mean, it it doesn't take a genius to figure out the math here. It's just kind of shocking to me, but let let's move on to the rest of it. But I just wanted to make a really swing that home that, you know, you need to look at the numbers. Because that's where you're going to find the greed. Unions have a big problem with greed. It is not just Wall Street. Like if all these people, especially these super pissy millennials, if I can pronounce that word correctly, you know, they occupied Wall Street. Why don't they occupy these unions? You know, people think, especially younger people, they think that the money is just only controlled and manipulated by people wearing a suit and that work in these sky rises or high rises or whatever. That's not true. Unions are just as corrupt as companies on Wall Street. Just because someone doesn't look like a banker or a hedge fund manager, that doesn't mean that they don't have problems with greed, and that doesn't mean they are not trying to control your economy or your bank account. Like, just you know, it doesn't matter what clothing someone is wearing; it's their intentions that come from their heart that matter. What are their intentions, and what are they putting their energy into? That's where you need to look. Like it doesn't matter if someone's wearing a suit or a a plaid shirt with jeans. Both could be crooks. And that's what we're seeing here. And what I make what I want to make a point is that you know what Wall Street is more regulated than these unions. That's why these unions are able to get away with this kind of stuff. But no one wants to even think about looking at unions as a form of greed. because they just say oh we're the american worker the american worker we're blue collar blue collar blue collar no you're not you're not a blue collar worker if you make 171k a year like that that's beyond white collar work that's insane that is so unbelievably ridiculous it's just shocking to me anyway um moving on to the next section cuz i don't want to raise my blood pressure on that that that's not a good reason to ever raise your blood pressure on any of that cuz it's for me personally I pray about stuff so it's like I know the Lord will deal with that in his own way on time not my problem um but it's good to be aware of stuff so that way you know what to pray for you know what to be knowledgeable about and when you see things in the news or if you see something going on within your community it has to do with unions misbehaving like this 
because this is misbehaving big time on an economical and global scale when you're educating you know about stuff that's going on you can call them out on it and i say that respectfully when you call someone out on something you do it in a cool calm cooth manner my 3 c's because if you do it any other way you're doing it wrong and you're not being respectful like i can be irritated and shocked about this all day and all night but if i don't handle it correctly then i've already lost the battle i've already lost my cause you know what i mean so it's better to just be calm about it and approach it in a professional business like manner because if you do it in any other way you've already lost especially when you're going up against someone that is as powerful as this group you really need to dot your eyes and cross your t's with this one so we're going to go on to the 1934 west coast waterfront strike it says long shoremen on the west coast ports had either been uh, unorganized or represented by company unions since the years immediately after world war 1 when the shipping companies and i don't know if this word is steve doring firms had imposed the open shop after a series of failed strikes long shoremen in san francisco in san francisco then the major port on the coast were required to go through a hiring hall operated by a company union known as the blue book system for the color of the union's membership book The industrial workers of the world had attempted to organize longshoremen, sailors and fishermen in the 1920s. A number of former IWW members and other militants such as Harry Bridges, an Australian-born sailor who became a longshoreman after coming to the United States, soon joined the International Longshoremen's Association when passage of the National Industrial Recovery Act in 1933 led to an explosion in union membership. in the ILA among West Coast longshoremen. Those activists known as the I don't know how to pronounce this Albion Hall group after their usual meeting place in San Francisco made contacts with like-minded activists at other ports. They pressed demands for a coast-wide contract, a union-run hiring hall, and an industry-wide waterfront federation and led the membership in rejecting the weak gentlemen's agreement. that the conservative ILA leadership had negotiated with the employers when the employers offered to arbitrate but only on the condition that the union agree to the open shop the union struck every west coast port on May 9th 1934 so basically this union's like if we don't it's basically our way or the highway and i don't like that cuz that tells me they are not willing to come to the table and work things out They're acting like a spoiled rotten kid throwing a hissy fit in the aisle and Toys R Us, which Toys R Us is no longer around. They filed bankruptcy, but still it's it's worth knowing that this even from the beginning this union has been throwing a hissy fit and being unrealistic. Because you have to remember there's uh, you know they're coming out of the roaring 20s, they're going into the Great Depression, and there's other things going on here, but yet they're going to throw a hissy fit about things. It goes on to say the strike was a violent one when strikers attacked the stockade in which the employers were housing strike breakers in San Pedro, California on May 15th. The employers private guards shot and killed two strikers. Similar battles broke out in San Francisco and Oakland, California, Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington. Notice those are the ports. The ports that you and I have not been paying attention to all these years. When the employers made a show of force in order to reopen the port in San Francisco, a pitched battle broke out on the I don't know how you pronounce that in Barcadero in San Francisco between police and strikers. Two strikers were killed on July 5th by a policeman's shotgun blast into a crowd of picketers and onlookers. This incident is known as Bloody Thursday and is commemorated every year by ILWU members. When the National Guard moved in, sorry, excuse me, when the National Guard moved in to patrol the waterfront, the picketers pulled back. The San Francisco and Alameda County General, or sorry, Central Labor Councils voted to call a general strike in support of the longshoremen, shutting down much of San Francisco and the Bay Area for four days, ending with the union's agreement to arbitrate the remaining issues in dispute. The union won most of its demands in that arbitration proceeding. Those that did not win outright it gained through hundreds of job actions after the strikers returned to work as the union gradually 
wrested control over the pace of work and the employer's power to hire and fire from the shipping and Steve Doran companies through the mechanism of hiring halls. Union members also engaged in a number of sympathy strikes in support of other maritime unions' demands. Okay, we're going to move on to World War II and integration of African Americans. It says the ILWU admitted African Americans in the 1930s, and during World War II, its San Francisco section alone had an estimated 800 black members at a time when most San Francisco unions excluded black workers. and resisted implementation of President Roosevelt's Executive Order 8802 which took place in 1941 and this was against racial discrimination in the US defense industry however black union members were a minuscule group within the ILWU leadership hierarchy with the few exceptions concentrated in the Oakland local which had an even larger black membership than San Francisco Also by the own admission of Richard Linden, the San Francisco Locals president, the ILWU failed to work on the upgrading promotion of its black members. Still, in the judgment of historian Albert S. Browsard, as far as blacks were concerned, the ILWU stood ahead and shoulders above other Bay Area locals in virtually every respect during World War II. As the union extended membership to more and more workers during the war, it would experience incredible growth, counting roughly 25,000 dues-paying members at its inception. The union's roles expanded to over 65,000 at the end of World War II due to a boost in wartime production and a, and a successful campaign to organize warehouse workers away from the ports. Okay, the next section is about the survival outside the CIO and return to the AFL CIO. It says here expulsion had no real effect, however, on either the ILWU or Bridges power within it. The organization continued to negotiate agreements with less strife than in the 1930s and 1940s, and Bridges continued to be reelected without serious opposition. The International Fishermen and Allied Workers of America joined with the union in the 1950s. Excuse me, the union negotiated a groundbreaking agreement in 1960 that permitted the extensive mechanization of the docks, significantly reducing the number of longshore workers in return for generous job guarantees and benefits for those displaced by the changes. That might explain why some of their wages started to go up really high during this time. The agreement, however, highlighted the lesser status that less senior members known as B men enjoyed bridges reacted uncharacteristically defensively to these workers complaints which were given additional sting by the fact that many of the B men were black the additional longshore work produced by the vietnam war allowed bridges to meet the challenge by opening up more jobs and making determined efforts to recruit black applicants The ILWU later faced similar challenge from women who found it even harder to enter the industry and the union. I'm not surprised by that. Bridges had difficulty giving up his opposition, or sorry, giving up his position in the ILWU even though he explored the possibility of merging it with the ILA or the Teamsters in the early 1970s. He finally retired in 1977, but only after ensuring that Louis Goldblatt the longtime secretary treasurer of the union and his logical successor was denied the opportunity to replace him the inland boatmen's union that's hard to say whose members operate tugs barges passenger ferries and other vessels on the west coast and who had formerly been part of the seafarers international union of north america merged with the ILWU in 1980 i'm surprised it was allowed because that would easily be a monopoly The ILWU rejoined the AFL-CIO in 1988 and disaffiliated with it in 2013. Very interesting there. It says here the ILWU disaffiliated from the AFL-CIO on August 30th, 2013, accusing the AFL-CIO of unwillingness to punish other unions when their members crossed ILWU picket lines and over federal legislative policy issues. Who knows with that? They tend to get pissy and moody about jurisdictional wars. I say, who cares? Get the job done. We, the the workers, other workers in the United States, we don't have that luxury of throwing a hissy fit. 
And also, we are also consumers, so it's just like, just get us our goods, but don't overcharge us. It's getting ridiculous. It says here, um, Harry Bridges led the union from 1934 to 1977. I think that's a big problem. I think that they should only be allowed to be president or serve in their position like for four years max. Because I think you need to have new leadership in there. Because I think the more you have new leadership, the less likely you are to have problems. Because then you're not going to have a power-hungry, well, a less power-hungry, greedy organization. So then it goes down to the ILWU. was accused of engaging in a slowdown of work on docks in 2002. I remember something about this. As an alternative to a strike to support its contract demands and negotiations with the Pacific Maritime Association, the union has documented that productivity was in fact stable at that time, while the employer claims to have contradictory data. The employers responded to the slowdown with a lockout, disallowing the workers to do their jobs. The Bush administration sought a national emergency injunction under the Taft-Hartley Act against both the employers and the union and threatened to move longshore workers from coverage under the National Labor Relations Act to coverage under the Railway Labor Act, which would effectively prevent longshore workers from striking. I would love that. This is a long-time goal of the PMA and other companies whose workers the ILWU represents. The longshore contract that resulted from 2002 negotiations expired on July 1st, 2008. The ILWU and the PMA reached a tentative agreement for a new six-year longshore contract in July 2008. In the following weeks, the ILWU membership voted to approve the new contract. It goes on to say, in protest of the I- Iraq war, The ILWU encouraged longshore workers to shut down all West Coast ports by walking off the job on May 1st, 2008 to make May Day a no-peace, no-work holiday. How pathetic is that? They're So basically they're trying to shut down an industry because they don't agree with a war. Who cares? Like, do your job. So they're basically going to punish the rest of the United States because they want to be political. You know, doing a job and being employed is not about being political. It's about doing your job. This is what I'm talking about with unions having way too much control. On May 1st, more than 10,000 ILWU members from all 29 West Coast ports voluntarily stopped work with some attending rallies held by the ILWU where the union called for working class people to withhold their labor to protest the war. They call them working class people, but yet they're making $171,000 a year. That is pathetic. Like, what liars? I mean, this is stupid. The employer, the Pacific Maritime Association, filed a complaint against the union for conducting what it saw as an illegal work stoppage. I agree. The court agreed with the PMA and determined that the ILWU had conducted a secondary boycott against the PMA which is illegal, thank you, under the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. Thank you. Okay, so the next one is, in August 2013, the ILWU disaffiliated with the American Federation of Labor Congress of Industrial Organizations, also known as AFL-CIO. The ILWU said that members of other AFL-CIO unions were crossing its picket lines, and the AFL-CIO had done nothing to stop it. Must have a pity party. The ILWU also cited the AFL-CIO's willingness to compromise on key policies such as labor law reform, immigration reform, and health care reform. The Longshoremen's Union said it would become an independent union. So basically, do what we want or else. It's like I could care less. In August 2014, the Israeli-owned ZIM, I don't know how to pronounce this, almost looks like pirate, that Perios was the subject of a major demonstration of the Port of Oakland instigated by the Arab Resource and Organizing Center. Approximately 500 protesters opposed hmm, to Israeli military actions in the Gaza Strip participated. The AROC claimed to have been supported by ILWU dock workers who refused to unload the ship's cargo, stating that workers honored our picket and stood on the side of justice. Oh, B.S., goodness. However, the union denied this, saying it had taken no, op- no position on the conflict in Gaza, but in cases when unsafe circumstances arise, the union must protect the safety of its members in the workplace. 
kind of find that hard to believe. An ILWU spokesman said workers were not prepared to become involved because of safety issues related to the size of the demonstration and the heavy police presence. However, several news reports and blogs claim that some members from ILWU locals 34 and 10 openly supported the protesters. On August 21st, the Pirates have repronounced that docked at a different terminal. where two dozen longshoremen unload the cargo overnight. Good. Good. At least somebody did the right thing and helped these people. After expiration of its conflict with the Pacific Maritime Association July 1, 2014, months-long contract negotiations with the Pacific Maritime Association were characterized by backups in West Coast ports and mutual accusations of a slowdown. Base pay was about $35 an hour. That's quite a bit. In Southern California, the slowdown caused more than 25 cargo ships to idle off the coast, affecting over 700 mariners, primarily overseas Filipinos. See, this is what I'm talking about. The union doesn't care who it hurts. This union thinks it's all about them. So when we're talking about 25 cargo ships, they had to remain idle off the coast. That means whatever was on their ship could not make it into the United States. That means you and me, the consumer, did not have access to those goods because of this union. That's what that means, like they have way too much power. In 2014, when the Pacific Maritime Association reported that the nationwide average, sorry, the nationwide average ILWU union member earned $147,000, the Seattle Times found that in 2013, longshore employees earned an average of $85,000 in Seattle and $114,000 in Tacoma, while clerks earned an average of $153,000 in Seattle. and $159,000 in Tacoma, and four men in Seattle and Tacoma averaged $204,000. That's a little over $200K per worker that is making this kind of money. The union stated that this average pay does not include casual part-time workers who are not union members and earn a minimum of $26 per hour. So basically they're trying to say, well, it's not as bad as you think, but it is. In November 2019, a terminal operations company, International Container Terminal Services, Oregon, won a $94 million jury trial verdict against ILWU for unlawful labor practices including work stoppages, slowdowns, safety gimmicks, and other what is that? Co- coercive action. Sorry, my eyes are getting blurry because I'm tired, which occurred between August 2013 and March 2017 at the Port of Portland, Oregon terminal and resulted in all shippers ceasing to use the terminal. In March 2020, the judge reduced the amount to 19 million. What a rip. I would have increased it if I could. <laughs> I don't know if they can with with judgments like that, probably not. But I would have said, "Hey, go for the 94 million." I wouldn't have dropped it. This says that the ILWU members went on strike for 8 minutes 46 seconds on June 9th to protest the murder of George Floyd. Oh, give me a break. And for 8 hours on June 10th at all 29 of the US Pacific Coast ports in solidarity with the protests sweeping the nation. This is ridiculous. Okay. Here's the thing. These unions they act like they're for people but they're really not. They're just using like the for example the murder of George Floyd that protest they're just using it as an excuse not to work to not do their labor like they're trying to say that they're standing in solidarity what about standing in solidarity with the United States see what's happening here they can make, they can make it seem like they care but if they really cared about the american people and everybody then they wouldn't be making over $170,000 a year and they would be doing their labor. Like yes, it's horrible that man died. Yes, you know, but here's the thing. It is not the job of a union to stop working. Because whenever they stop working, it increases the cost of goods and they are not honoring their contract. You know, there's a way, an appropriate way to give your condolences, but to just walk out on the job that's ridiculous. I mean, this is I just kind of have to have to call the BS card on this. Because yes, it's horrible when someone dies. But these workers don't really care about anybody else. Like all they're doing is they're they're cherry picking causes and they're cherry picking 
catastrophic events to make it look like they care when they really don't. Because I don't believe they actually care about what happened to George Floyd. I really don't. Because all they're doing is they're using hot topics. They're using these really intense push buttons, I would say, to give themselves an excuse to not go to work. But here is a union that has too much power, too much money, too much money, and they have a lot of greed. And it's ridiculous. And I don't like it when organizations like this try and latch on to some horrific event and make it seem like it's about them and that they care. Cuz all they're doing whenever they latch on to horrific events like what happened to George Floyd, all they're doing is putting their name and their organization in the paper and putting it online. It's just free advertising. They don't really care. I don't believe that they care. If I honestly thought they cared, I'd be like, "Hey, good for them. They 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 stood up for something." No. They're just standing up for themselves. That's all. It's about money. And it's about them not having to go to work, but them paying to go to work. Like, can you imagine going on strike, not showing up to work, making up all these reasons to not go to work, but yet you make 171,000 a year or even $204,000 a year? Like how pathetic is that? They're using the death of somebody as an excuse as a reason to not go to work even if it's just for 8 minutes 46 seconds look time is money and all they did was use this person's death as a way to to get themselves in a newspaper talk about sick like that bugs me that that is so unbelievably wrong it's just ridiculous and what i find interesting is that you know they claim to be against the iraq war but you know because they protested it but are they for america they're not for america because they've got a chokehold on all of our seaports so if they were actually for america they would not be protesting like that and you know so those things like if i was to show up at my job and say oh i'm protesting whatever war is going on at the moment i'm protesting so i'm not going to do work but I, but i expect you to pay me my employer would raise their eyebrows and be like what Like you know the country still needs to move forward. We all still have a job to do. But these unions like this one give themselves permission not to work. And then they pat themselves on the back, making it seem like they are more patriotic than the rest of us when they are not. If anything when someone tries to get paid for work that they're not doing and that they were refusing to do, but then they're trying to make it seem like they're more American than the rest of us, that is not American. That's what communists do. That's what fascists do. Like, you know, it, it is such a really sick form of greed to make it seem like you're special, you're the exception, but yet you're not willing to do what everybody else is willing to do to support the country and to do the right thing and to promote America and to not promote yourself. See the this type of organization they're just make it seem like it's all about them. It's not all about them. It's about the United States because here's the thing, if we don't have a country, none of us have jobs. None of us. It doesn't matter if you are in a union or not. But you know what is a better union? The United States to form to form a more perfect union. So this type of labor union is very disappointing to me because I have no doubt that their work is hard. I have no doubt that they've had problems and I'm sure we don't know every little thing that's going on, but still they've got a behavior problem with greed and they have a behavior problem with power. Extreme. Extreme. So, um anyway, that is it for this um lovely podcast. This one was definitely interesting. And so for the next one we will be looking at the International Union of Operating Engineers. This one should be interesting because it goes back to 1896. So um but if you have any questions, concern, feedback, whatever the case may be, feel free to message me at yourlaborlaws@gmail.com. And again that's yourlaborlaws@gmail.com. So until next time, I pray that you're happy, healthy and whole and that you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.